Um, well, I had a patient right before I um, uh, went on vacation who knew I was going on vacation, and I put him through all his testing and stuff like that, and um, he did great through surgery, and then post-op day two was found on the floor of, the, uh, of his room uh, and um, unresponsive, et cetera, and, and worked on him. He actually sort of came back with time, but it's it's something that is is a devastating thing. You do all this hard work, and as fellows, it's really cool. You get to do the work, um, but as attending, you know, you have to go talk to the family afterwards and say, you know, Grandpa was doing so great, and we did everything we could, and and at least in, in this case, we were able to tell the family in advance. Look, he's high risk. We knew the reasons why, and we discussed them with them so that they're aware. Um, as fellows uh, and residents, it's uh, the more that you can to give that information to the attending, the more they're going to let you operate on, on their patients. I don't know how to click forward one of these. OK, here we go. Um, is this? Um, nothing's happening. No, you can use the, uh, this one here. Advance. OK. OK, there we go. And go back. All right. Um, well. Uh, you know, so some of the some of the things we especially worry about and we'll talk about in this talk have to do with the cardiac risk factors, but it, it does involve the whole body as as we talk about. And um, we talk about not so much um, uh, uh, we're optimizing the person for surgery, but we're risk stra stratif stratif uh, tr um, putting a risk stratification to what level they're at in terms of high, moderate, or low, and also then what we're going to do about it if we do find that. Um, and there's, there's a new revised um, risk factor, and I'll go through a few of these different um, um, uh, uh, setups that, that have historically been done so that you're aware of them, because I think they were, they're sort of like Homer Simpson, oh, this makes sense, the person's got a bad heart, they're not going to do as well. Or they're old, oh, of course, they're not going to do as well. But this gives you a little bit more quantitative analysis to be able to, to approach the problem and decide what, what are you going to do beforehand, or do you cancel surgery, et cetera. Um, this, um, uh, the risk calculator is actually, if you go to that website, uh, I'm, I'm grateful to, to um, um, Medi for having sent me these slides and they sort of said don't change them, but uh, more radiation. Your computer went uh, to sleep. But, yeah, but, but basically um, uh, it, it'll send you to the new website where there's a risk calculator. Um, um, MACE is a major adverse cardiac events. I'm not quite sure why the cardiac surgeons and cardiologists love these terminologies. But um, so low risk is basically that you've got less than 1% chance, and anything greater than 1% risk of a major event is considered high risk and, and ought to have something done about it. Am I going the wrong direction? Okay, so functional capacity, again, sort of, oh, I, I understand this makes sense. Uh, you know, uh, if someone can do a lot of strenuous exercises, they they can convert or do more metabolic work than 10, what's considered uh, the, the calorie requirements for 10 um, METs, uh, strenuous sports, et cetera. They're in a very high functioning capacity. Um, hopefully a lot of our patients are in the moderate uh, functioning capacity. And this, again, has to do with how you risk stratify. Um, one of the best ways is uh, uh, to say, can you climb a flight of stairs without getting winded? That will give you a very good idea. And it's a, and it's you can qualitate that then on the chart beforehand, and puts that person in that uh, moderate risk. Um, poor Mets, uh, I love that baking, slow ballroom dancing, <laughs> golfing with a cart. So you can ask the person to golf, stop using the cart, and see how they do with that. Um, and basically, this this is a very busy slide. Uh, does this point? No, doesn't point. It it basically goes through what you think of in, in your own mind is, if, if it's emergency, take them to surgery and you can tell them what their risk stratification is based on that. If they're going for a low risk procedure like a cataract uh, operation, it doesn't matter what uh, METs they can qualify for because they're at such low risk for having anything done. You don't need any further workup. It's those people that are in the in-between um, where, where they're, or, or the low, um, uh, they're not able to uh, even bake or, or do uh, slow dancing. Um, that you're going to especially be concerned about and start a workup on and do some pharmacologic testing. So, so the most sort of famous um, and really groundbreaking in the sense of, of uh, sort of stating the obvious in a sense was the gold um, 
um, an article. Um, that, I skipped right past that. I think that was the blank slide. Here we go, yeah. Uh, Goldman article which looked at the multifactorial risks. And this, this is often quoted even though it's from 1977 because a lot of the things are validated. And a lot of the newer uh, stratifications are done based on, on this as a, you know, sort of a modification of it. And it t looked at a, a whole variety of factors. Um, if they had an S1 gallop or, in other words, CHF. Um, if they had had a myocardial infarction within six months. A rhythm that was other than sinus. Um, if they had a lot of PVCs, uh, if they had had, uh, if they were going to be having a major surgery like intrathoracic intraoperative, their age based on that, and then also aortic stenosis, which is a very important um, separate factor. Uh, if it was an emergency surgery and what their overall general condition was, nutritional status, et cetera. So, um, and a lot of those, and basically they gave them scores and um, with a total of possible 53, and then they stratified them out. Um, so I'll quickly go through this. So, oh, sorry. This is probably the other very important take-home point was creatinine was also not listed in that factor, but was is it is really one of our major uh, risk uh, modifiers. So people that have creatinine levels over two, even if they're not on dialysis, put them into a, a significant increased risk for uh, bad outcomes. People that are anemic. Uh, have uh, particularly chronic anemia uh, are more prone towards complications as well, probably because of the local hypoxia that goes on. All right, so let's skip ahead. This stuff here. Okay, so um, I'm going to sort of skip ahead about the atenolol because a lot of this study was actually um, uh, shown to be maybe inaccurate or incorrect, and, and actually the author got in a lot of trouble for some. Uh, modification of data that what didn't happen but it, it did have to go with the fact and like meaningful use now still asks other people are taking beta blockers uh, beforehand uh, before surgery because this study had shown such a dramatic difference in terms of post-operative recuperation at at six months and one year and even two years out um, uh, so th I'll skip ahead because a lot of this was not done so they they ran a post C trial where they looked at people, a lot of people using that. And the bottom line for that was um, uh, because of the academic fraud, et cetera here, that was done, that they weren't really, what they had said initially was everybody should be on beta blockers, and then it turned out there was actually a lot of people that were dying because of that. Um, so what ultimately came out, let me skip ahead here. Sorry. Um, without um, basically people that were class three and class four uh, uh, cardiac uh, patients should have beta blockers, and those that were class one and class two probably shouldn't. Um, and you know there was there was a back and forth about the, if they were giving too much uh, beta blocker uh, in these particular trials, and they should have used smaller doses, et cetera, and monitor the people more individually. So, um, and and then their final. Uh, uh, evaluation was that we need more studies to really look at this, and maybe we need di different beta blockers to do this. Um, what are we trying to decide? Do we need to send these people for cardiac evaluation uh, that's more invasive and or cardiac intervention that's more invasive? And we're trying to kind of model our, our planning in advance of our non-cardiac surgery for this, sort of get them through the surgery. The, um, it's. It's not needed, as I said, in the low-risk patients. In um, patients uh, who are, really need surgery, then you have to decide what's our best way to get them through the surgery without uh, delaying the surgery too long. And uh, the timing of it does depend on discussing with the cardiologist when do you need to operate the, on them because one of their major ways of, of doing surgery is to place a drug-eluting stent that's clearly shown benefit over a metal uh, or non-drug-eluting non stent in the coronaries in terms of their long-term outcomes. But we know that they also need to be on uh, antiplatelet that's significant uh, for at least a year. And they found that it, these terrible things were happening. People were doing great, and then all of a sudden they die. And people that were taken off of 
the stronger antiplatelet agents like Plavix or now the new ones, Tigracil, et cetera, they actually um, had these acute thrombosis that was occurring maybe because of the uh, drug effect wearing off or edge effect that was occurring. And so they, um, they really strongly recommend that the people be on these agents for at least 12 months before they can take them off of them. Otherwise, they're at marked risk for sudden uh, death uh, occurring or at least severe MI. If, um, if you can do a surgery where you can keep the people on Plavix and, and, and or any of these stronger agents, uh, safely, even controlling the local hematoma that might occur, say in the neck or in the groin or in the leg, then you can proceed again balancing the, the risks versus benefits of the surgery. But if you're going to be doing like major aortic surgery or intrathoracic uh, surgery, uh, you really have to think twice about that and discuss with the cardiologist about doing this. So they did this study where they looked at people that were uh, uh, 40 patients who they did non cardiac high risk surgery uh, uh, and they took them off of their bleeding, and they actually did pretty poorly. Eight, eight out of 11, they had uh, seven myocardial infarctions, eight deaths, et cetera. And um, then they came up with these conclusions that it should be delayed at a minimum of two to four weeks, but the reality is that actually if they had waited for six weeks, um, seems to be the data that they came up with. So non, uh, uh, or bare metal stents, if you can wait for at least six weeks after surgery, or keep them on their aspirin and Plavix. And the same thing, too, for the drug eluding. If you can wait for at least 12 months, and there's been some new modification saying maybe you could do it at six months, put them on a, a heparin window, uh, treat them sort of like you do with Coumadin patients that they could get through surgery well. Um, so I'll skip through that. That's basically what that showed. Um, angioplasty alone, um, you still need to keep the people. There's unstable plaque probably available. Uh, for further thrombosis or, or occlusion of those vessels, and so they recommended at least 14 days. Uh, and that's only level B evidence uh, or level C evidence, depending on it's not great because uh, they don't do it very often. Uh, so the last thing um, uh, in terms of heart disease is aortic stenosis as an independent risk factor is very significant, even for carotid surgery where you don't expect a lot of fluid shifts. You have to be very aware of patients uh, if, if they have severe aortic stenosis. And it's generally very strong uh, indication to really encourage the patients to have that treated, even if, with, if it's temporizing, say, with an angioplasty, now that they can do a valvuloplasty um, to help with that. Because fluid shifts can uh, make a good operation into a very fatal one quite quickly. And uh, if the patients who are not candidates are really refused, but they absolutely need, they're having crescendo TIAs or, or even uh, uh, recurrent strokes, <clears throat> then you have to really be in close con concert with the uh, anesthesiologist, talk about regional anesthesia, talk about really minimizing their fluid. Um, uh, and they can get through that, but they can have sudden down downturns in events otherwise. Um, I'll skip through this uh, for time. Mitral stenosis and aortic regurge. Uh, mitral regurg are actually not as catastrophic in most patients unless they're really severe. Um, and um, you can usually get through them, again, with the patients with treating uh, and discussing with the anesthesiologist beforehand whether they, they do that. Obviously, if, if they're really severe, you ought to treat those first beforehand. So, um, and CHF or, or, or other obstructive um, cardiomyopathies, again, most patients are really in the moderate risk group. It depends on their baseline. But you have to keep in mind, again, fluid hypovolemia, adrenergic stimulation, or if you really drop off their um, peripheral resistance, that they can have a rapid, very rapid hemodynamic deterioration and die after a very, very small or successful operation, even like a low risk. Um, so assessing the LV function in terms of uh, the, the American Heart classification is helpful. Again, most patients can get through surgery as long as you're aware of those fluid shifts. Uh, and, and the overall um, idea is in patients who have no EKG changes uh, and no cardiac history who can perform at a METS level of, of moderate or high, they really probably don't need any other workup. It's the patients that are, uh, you know, slow dancing or baking cakes uh, and can't get up a flight of stairs without uh, that or who have significant EKG. Uh, abnormalities that ought to be worked up further. Um, 
again, history and physical is a very important guide for that. You, you don't have to have all of these tests if you listen to the heart, actually, and uh, he, look for murmurs and stenosis, and if you talk to the patients or even make them just do the proceed, do the process of why don't you walk up a flight of stairs, come back, I can see how wounded you are. Um, the um, in, individual beta blockers sh should be individualized. Um, in, in the end, if they have class three or class four heart disease, it's probably beneficial, uh, but then the dosage has to be uh, really watched for by the cardiologist. The one and twos probably actually may be uh, hurtful in the end result. Elective surgery, if they can do with bare metal stents, you should try and wait at least for six weeks if you can, because the uh, risk factors, and with drug eluding, you really need to keep them on their antiplatelet agent and deal with the bleeding that occurs. Um, there's a couple questions. This isn't real easy. If someone is really um, uh, healthy uh, and you're, they're having cataract surgery, you can go ahead and proceed with that. That's a no-brainer. Uh, if someone who has uh, a uh, bare metal stent in place and he's waiting for uh, knee surgery, which is essentially elective, minimal decrease, recent, recent times you should wait for four to six weeks. There you go. All right, and uh, beta blockers are individualized. Okay, very All good. Right. Thank you well, very much. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. <laughs>